MegCram.com. Welcome to another MegCram COVID-19 update. Another way of looking at the pandemic is to look at the number of deaths per million population. We've done that here. You can see that a number of the countries in terms of deaths per million population are almost always in Europe. In fact, the United States is down here on the list at 218 deaths per million. For the United States, the daily new cases seem to be holding stable with some undulations, as many of you correctly pointed out, probably have to do with weekend reporting. And those are markedly accentuated there in terms of the daily deaths. For those of you who are more interested locally for where I work, this is in California, and we've got San Bernardino County and Riverside County with the number of new cases and new deaths yesterday. This week I am working in Riverside County, and we are getting a steady stream of COVID-19 patients being admitted to the hospital. Because of our short supply of negative pressure rooms, we're having to double up some of those patients in those rooms. We're also not doing elective surgeries, and a number of other procedures are not going on. So even though the hospital is not overflowing with patients, it does seem to feel as though COVID-19 is taking over the population of patients in the hospital. I wanted to continue our discussion about ACE2 and superoxide. So we said that superoxide was a bad thing, that it caused endothelial dysfunction, the endothelium being the lining of your vasculature. And we said that there were a number of things that happened when ACE2, this enzyme that was inactivated by SARS-CoV-2, went down. Because ACE2 converts angiotensin II into angiotensin 1-7. When you lose ACE2, you accumulate angiotensin 2, and that causes a stimulation of superoxide. When you lose angiotensin 1-7, you lose the inhibition of the creation of superoxide. Also, SARS-CoV-2 directly will increase superoxide because it recruits PMNs, and those are a certain type of white blood cell. Now, going on up here, we have angiotensin 1, which is converted to angiotensin 2, through the ACE enzyme. And so ACE inhibitors inhibit ACE, and what they do, in addition to inhibiting ACE, is they also tend to increase ACE2, which is the enzyme that we just talked about. And ARBs will block the effect of angiotensin II on the creation of superoxide, but ARBs may also increase the amount of ACE2. The bottom line is understanding that when you have a SARS-CoV-2 infection, you're going to get increased endothelial dysfunction. So let's see what happens when that occurs. And we've looked at this paper before that was published almost 20 years ago out of Boston University School of Medicine. It describes how all of these things come together with endothelial dysfunction and reactive oxygen species that we've talked about. And if you lose some of these protective mechanisms like superoxide dismutases, glutathione peroxidases, catalase, and glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, then you're going to get increased oxidative stress. And we've shown you those things here before. Here we have an increase in superoxide, and it takes superoxide dismutase to reduce it back to oxygen and hydrogen peroxide. And then through glutathione peroxidase, you can reduce hydrogen peroxide back to water, Through catalase, you can reduce it back to oxygen and water, and there's ways of recharging all of these things. For instance, zinc, copper, and manganese is essential for superoxide dismutase, and certain types of antioxidants can reduce glutathione peroxidase. What's really important in normal endothelial function is this molecule called nitric oxide. In fact, nitric oxide is how angiotensin 1-7 works. And so we've gone over this stuff before, but the focus of today's talk is thrombosis. And so there are well-established papers taking endothelial dysfunction, or ECD, and connecting it with thrombosis. And it also connects it through the bioavailability of nitric oxide. It says here that deficiency of these enzymes, like, for instance, the superoxide dismutases, glutathione peroxidases, increase oxidative stress and nitric oxide inactivation, and as such, can lead to endothelial cell dysfunction or account for the underlying mechanism of endothelial cell dysfunction associated with a given atherothrombotic risk factor. So those things are connected. Oxidative stress, 
nitric oxide, endothelial cell dysfunction, and thrombosis. And so the question comes up, is there oxidative stress occurring in COVID-19 infection? And it seems almost assuredly that because of the fact that it affects the ACE2 receptor and enzyme, there is going to be oxidative stress. And the second question is, how does it affect thrombosis? Well, there was an article that was published on April 15, 2020, in Thrombosis Research, and it describes a patient who came in and what happened with their coagulation factors. And what it showed was that there was a massive elevation of this von Willebrand factor. And this von Willebrand factor, the antigen was 555% of normal and the von Willebrand factor was 520% of normal activity, when normal is 42 to 168. There were also other factors that were increased, including factor 8 of the coagulation cascade. And even they realized that the increased von Willebrand factor points towards massive endothelial stimulation and damage with release of von Willebrand factor from Weibull palade bodies, Interestingly, endothelial cells express ACE2, the receptor for SARS-CoV-2, thus possibly mediating endothelial cell activation. So you're probably wondering what these Weibull palade bodies are. They're only found in endothelial cells, and these tiny little bodies release these stringy-type substances called von Willebrand factor, which allows for coagulation, and it allows platelets and the clot to form together. When there's so much destruction of the endothelial cell, this von Willebrand's factor is released in high concentrations into the blood. Here's another article that was published in 2017 titled Endothelial Cell Von Willebrand Factor Secretion in Health and Cardiovascular Disease. And notice what it says here in the abstract. The main function of von Willebrand factor is to initiate platelet adhesion upon vascular injury. The hallmark of acute and chronic inflammation is the widespread activation of endothelial cells, which provokes excessive von Willebrand factor secretion from the endothelial storage cell pool. The level of von Willebrand factor in blood not only reflects the state of endothelial activation early on in the pathogenesis, but also predicts disease outcome. And this is key. Elevation in the blood level of von Willebrand factor occurs either by pathological increase in the rate of basal von Willebrand factor secretion or increased evoked von Willebrand factor release from dysfunctional or activated endothelial cells. And that's exactly what we see here, we believe, in COVID-19. The increase in plasma von Willebrand factor is predictive of prothrombotic complications and multi-organ system failure associated with reduced survival in the context of severe inflammatory response syndrome, type 2 diabetes mellitus, stroke, and other inflammatory cardiovascular disease states. This is exactly what we're seeing in COVID-19. This chapter focuses on the role of high circulating von Willebrand factor in thrombotic and inflammatory disease while paying attention to the emerging von Willebrand factor-related drug development strategies. They go on to talk about how von Willebrand factor is a surrogate marker of endothelial cell dysfunction. The highly multimeric, that means many of them all together, elongated form of von Willebrand factor is not present in healthy plasma. So they don't see a lot of this highly multimeric form in healthy plasma, but is found in various pathological settings. This observation can be explained by the fact that von Willebrand factor senses shear forces and remodels accordingly. Atomic force micrographs have demonstrated at the single molecule level that under static conditions, von Willebrand factor assumes a globular conformation, whereas under high shear flow, von Willebrand factor turns into an extended chain format that forms ultra-large strings to which platelets can bind and initiate clot formation. This is what we're seeing in COVID-19 at sites of vascular damage and when shear stress is above 30,000 per second. Factor 8 is released from its carrier protein to provide factor 8 to the coagulation cascade. This is exactly what we saw in the article that described the COVID-19 patient. 
We now realize that while ultra-large molecular weight von Willebrand factor is essential for the normal hemostasis, this multimeric array should not become too large because it alters the thrombotic propensity. Now notice what they say here. In conclusion, excessive levels of highly prothrombotic and multimeric forms of von Willebrand factor and or Adam TS13 deficiency, and this Adam TS deficiency has to do with the platelets, but specifically what Adam TS does is it cleaves and cuts up von Willebrand factor. And believe it or not, it's a zinc containing metalloproteolase enzyme. And so essentially Adam TS reduces the effectiveness of von Willebrand factor. But this is a unifying pathological mechanism linking inflammation, oxidative stress, and thrombosis. So let's review up to this point. We have SARS-CoV-2, which causes an infection, and that reduces ACE2. And the reduction in ACE2 is going to increase angiotensin 2 and decrease angiotensin 1, 7. That together is going to increase oxidative stress with superoxide. That, as we've just talked about, is going to cause endothelial cell dysfunction. Endothelial cell dysfunction leads to an increase in von Willebrand's factor, which eventually leads to thrombosis. Now, there's a lot of dots to connect there, but again, we see that SARS-CoV-2 is a virus which attacks the ACE2 receptor, and that is the entry point. When it attacks the ACE2 receptor, it takes out of commission its catalytic site, and it is no longer able to convert angiotensin 2 to angiotensin 1-7. As a result, you have an increase in angiotensin 2 and a reduction in angiotensin 1-7. In addition to recruiting neutrophils, that causes increased superoxide creation, and that increase in superoxide creation causes endothelial cell dysfunction through a nitric oxide pathway. Because there are bodies in the endothelial cell that contain von Willebrand's factor, that gets spilled out, as we saw, up to 500% increase in its activity. And that increase in von Willebrand's factor through a number of complicated interactions is going to cause an increase in thrombosis locally where the inflammation is occurring. Now let's just connect those dots here because it's interesting. We know that ACE2 is involved in the infection. We know that ACE2 causes this pattern. We know that this pattern does cause an increase in superoxide. We know that superoxide and oxidative stress is going to cause endothelial cell dysfunction, which is going to release these little bodies inside that will increase von Willebrand's factor. We know, based on information and case reports, that we see an elevation in von Willebrand's factor, as we showed you here in the first article. And we can see here that von Willebrand's factor can cause an increase in thrombosis. And we also have good data that shows on autopsies that SARS-CoV-2 increases the amount of thrombosis. So yes, we are connecting the dots here, we don't know for a fact that this is happening in patients with COVID-19, but it seems very likely that this is the case. Let's take a look at some more data. You may remember back in March of 2020, there was some stir about the different blood types and whether or not the blood types would lead to a prognosis in terms of getting the COVID-19 infection, hospitalization, or even death. This is the study, and it actually came out of China. And let's take a look at some of the numbers that they found. In one of the studies, they simply looked at the general population in a community. And they looked at type A, B, AB, and O. And they found that in the population of 3,694, 32% were type A, 25% were type B, 9% were type AB, and 34% were type O. Then they looked at those that were admitted to the hospital with COVID-19. 
And so these are COVID-19 patients that are positive, but not just positive, but sick enough to actually be in the hospital. And what they noticed was that A went from 32 to 38 percent, B went to 26 percent, AB went to 10 percent, but O went to 26 percent. There was a drop here statistically significantly in type O. Then they looked at those that had actually died, and these were in 206 patients. The COVID patients that were positive were 1,775. So in those that died, 41% were type A, 24% were type B, 9% type AB, and 25% were type O. Again, statistically significantly lower. And they looked at several other populations in this study, and it held true across the board. In fact, they also felt that type O blood actually helped in terms of reducing the actual infection or entry of the virus into the cells because of antibodies. Now, key point, this paper at the time that it came out was not peer-reviewed. And as far as I know, it still has not been peer-reviewed. If somebody has information on that, I'd certainly love to hear it. We could also do some peer review on it here. But what I find really interesting is this peer-reviewed article from 2007, which clearly shows that there are a number of relationships between ABO blood group and von Willebrand factor levels. Yes, the same von Willebrand factor levels that we say might be tied in to our hypothesis. In the article, it states very specifically that several studies have documented the influence of ABO blood groups on plasma von Willebrand factor levels. In a large twin study, they found that 66% of the total variation in plasma von Willebrand factor levels was genetically determined, and that 30% of this genetic component was explained by the ABO blood group. Other studies have consistently reported that, and here it is, group O subjects have lower plasma von Willebrand levels than non-O individuals. So the question is, is this just a coincidence? Because it very well could be. Or is it possible that group O subjects have less of an increase in von Willebrand factor levels and therefore have less thrombosis and therefore have less of a mortality in COVID-19? That is just speculation at this point, but it's an interesting hypothesis that could be tested. There's also a determination between ABO blood group determinant and the ADAMTS13 which we talked about before. Remember that ADAMTS13 is what cuts up the von Willebrand factor. Interestingly here, it says that molymeric analysis and collagen binding assays both demonstrated that proteolysis, that means the cutting up of those von Willebrand factors that could be dangerous, was significantly faster for group O von Willebrand factor compared to non-O von Willebrand factor. There's also been a discussion about the fact that there are certain racial and ethnic minority groups that are overrepresented in terms of COVID-19. Specifically, it says here at the CDC, 33% of hospitalized patients were black compared to 18% in the community. It goes on to say, these data suggest an overrepresentation of blacks among hospitalized patients. They also noted that black or African Americans had death rates that were substantially higher than that of white or Asian persons. Now, when we go back to this article, it states here that Miller and colleagues studied the effect of ABO blood type and race on plasma von Willebrand factor levels and found that Caucasians had significantly lower levels than African Americans. Could this also be by coincidence? It's possible that whatever affects the level of von Willebrand's factor may be a risk factor for increasing death from COVID-19, but it could also be a coincidence. So why are there lower von Willebrand factor levels in blood group O? And it seems as though, according to this article, blood group O, for some reason, increases the clearance of von Willebrand's factor. So it very well may be that this increased von Willebrand factor is what is causing the thrombosis. And there are several mediators of this increased level of von Willebrand factor, not the least of which could be ABO subgroup types. So it would seem reasonable that if we were to put patients on anticoagulation, 
we might be able to reduce the risk of death. Well, enter this paper that was just published last month on April 27th. This article is titled, Anticoagulant Treatment is Associated with Decreased Mortality in Severe Coronavirus Disease 2019 Patients with Coagulopathy. And what they found was that in all comers, they didn't notice any difference in 28-day mortality in multivariate analysis. However, when they compared those patients that were sicker, they had six scores greater than four, and they also had D-dimers greater than six-fold of the upper limit of normal. They did notice that there was a statistically significant improvement in patients who were on anticoagulation with a p-value of 0.029 and 0.017. And so their conclusion was that anticoagulant therapy, mainly with low molecular weight heparin, appears to be associated with better prognosis in severe COVID-19 patients meeting SIC criteria or with a markedly elevated D-dimer. Now remember what the D-dimer is. A D-dimer is a marker in the blood that shows that coagulation and breakdown is occurring. So this is the hypothesis. This is what may be going on. We don't know for sure, but it seems as though the dots are connecting themselves here almost. SARS-CoV-2 causes a decrease in the ACE2, which causes an increase in angiotensin-2 and a decrease in angiotensin-1-7, increasing oxidative stress, causing endothelial cell dysfunction, increasing von Willebrand's factor, leading to thrombosis. So what do we do about it? Join us next time while we talk more about this topic and join us at medcram.com where all our COVID-19 updates are available. And we also have a number of other courses such as our ventilator course, our acid base course. Thanks for joining us.